AM560, The Answer. Listen to AM560, The Answer, online at 560theanswer.com, on the AM560 mobile app, on your Alexa-powered smart speaker, and on TuneIn, iHeart, and on Odyssey. America First with Sebastian Gorka, today at 3, right before Sean Thompson at 4, on AM560, The Answer. Top of the morning, Dan and Amy. Should we continue underwriting our enemies uh, as we decry Putin's invasion of Ukraine and his associated war crimes? Does it make sense that we're continuing to buy Russian oil? That question was put to, yes, yeah, she's really the vice president, Kamala Harris on the Today Show by Savannah Guthrie. And this was the vice president of the United States' response. Oh, boy. Another instant classic. Senator Joe Manchin, for example, mentioned that the U.S. is still currently buying approximately 600,000 barrels of, of crude and uh, other petroleum products every single day. Is that on the table? Is that something that the administration would continue, or would consider in terms of further sanctions, cutting off the oil and gas uh, part of the economy for Russia? Well, as you know, that on this issue, for example, we applaud Germany in terms of what it has done as it relates to Nord Stream 2, as it relates to what we need to do domestically as well as, as what we need to do in terms of this issue generally. We have, as the President said, uh, reevaluated what we're doing in terms of the strategic oil reserve here in the United States to make sure that it will not have an impact or we can mitigate the impact on the American consumer. Uh, but let's, let's take this one step at a time. I'm understanding that right now on the issue of energy, our allies have stood firm and unified in a way that many of the pundits didn't predict would happen um, to ensure that we are we are unified in our approach to this issue. Um, so uh, the, uh, the our allies are on our side, but we're not. Is that is that what I take away from uh, Vice President Harris's response? I guess uh, what she's trying to say is we need to do the things that we're doing and the time is now and that time is every day. It's having an effect on the rest of the administration because they're also offering excited utterances that um, are either unintentionally ironic or just unintelligible. On the unintentionally ironic front, Jen Psaki, the White House spokesman, had uh, this to say on CNN with the always earnest John Berman. Of course, it, it's not just frustrating, it's upsetting, it's horrifying. You know, I was at the State Department, the president was the vice president, the last time Russia invaded Ukraine. This is a pattern of horror from this pres- from President Putin and from the cronies around him. Yeah, um, a pattern of horror from this president. Uh, she almost a Freudian slip, but yes, uh, Jen, um, the last time that Putin invaded Ukraine, he was the vice president and you were at the State Department. Now he's the president and you're the White House spokesman and he's done it again. That is the pattern. You're right. What does that say about this administration and this president, former vice president? Thankfully, not everyone in the halls of power is a stone ass idiot. Uh, one of them who is not, who gave a uh, compelling speech on the House floor is Indiana Representative Victoria Sparks. Now, we've had her on the show oh, before. Yeah, that's right. She's Ukrainian. Uh, right. Uh, born in the Soviet Union, and uh, she offered this. I am very proud to have a strong freedom-fighting Ukrainian heritage. I actually was born in the Soviet Union, which, when Ukraine was under that evil country. And I'm so proud that strong, brave Ukrainians are willing to fight again and again to be free. It should inspire all of us. And their bravery and actions are unbelievable. It should teach us and maybe remind us what it means to be a free country and how hard is get your rights and freedoms back when you lose it. And we had so many people die for our freedoms. So let's value and cherish them. Yeah, it's always, uh, it's always uh, compelling to hear from somebody who lived under that sort of tyranny and came to the United States and is concerned about what's happening in this country, isn't it? 
For more on the topic, we're pleased to be joined by John Gabriel, editor-in-chief at ricochet.com, contributor to AZ Central as well, Arizona Republic, azcentral.com. John, thanks for joining us again. Appreciate it. Oh, great to be on, Dad. Thank you. Um, Kamala Harris uh, continues to, for some reason, be one of the administration's point people on explaining uh, our policy vis-a-vis Russia. I I don't know that she's providing a lot of help, except except perhaps maybe to Putin. Yeah, uh, heaven help us. Uh, With with the leaders that we have, um, it's very difficult to have a great deal of hope. Um, She doesn't know what she's doing, and it's very embarrassing. It's very apparent, um, not only to us Americans, but uh, definitely to um, any kind of people trying to challenge um, what we're trying to do in the world, uh, like Vladimir Putin. Um, She's not prepared. Uh, We saw the president of the State of the Union. He's not prepared. Um, I don't know, unless he wants to fight the Uranians. I'm I'm not sure. uh, (laughs) He inspires a whole lot of confidence in, uh, in our allies, that's for sure. Um, something else that is being bandied about and, and as well as happening, we talked to John Bolton on the show the other day, and he suggested that uh, another measure the administration could take is to uh, revoke all visas from Russians, and I presume Belarusians as well, now that they've joined Putin's uh, uh, revanchist uh, uh, effort. Um, and we saw the, uh, par- the International uh, Olympic Committee ban Belarusian and Russian athletes from the Paralympics. Um, You know, Russian students who want to come to this country uh, to be educated in, um, I mean, you know, at least back in the day, maybe not so much anymore, in the traditions of Western civilization or or, or special Olympians who want to participate. I mean, should we really be visiting punishment on them? That, That seems to me like so much virtue signaling without point except to hurt people that have really nothing to do with uh, with what Putin is doing. Right. There's this weird, um, very uh, self-punishing form of virtue signaling going on with trying to blame the entirety of Russia, Russia, Russian culture itself. I know in Italy they stopped teaching a Dostoevsky course. I'm like, okay, he's, <laughs> he's uh, passed away a little before Vladimir Putin take over took over and spent time in the gulag as well. So uh, maybe we shouldn't be doing this. Um, yeah, I know Canada has banned um, teenagers um, who happen to have Russian or Belarusian heritage from some huge hockey competition they have. It, it's getting a little crazy. We need to well, make well, sure. Well, also, to, too, uh, not to interrupt, but also, too, this is from oh, the no. same the group of people that says uh, the Chinese people are not the Chinese communists. Be sure to make the distinction. And we're not punishing the Chinese people for the genocide of President Xi and the Chinese communists. But here, when it comes to Russia, you know, we're very careful with the Chinese communists. Um, we're not so careful, uh, according to their proposals with the Russian communists. Why? Yeah, exactly. Um, They have been uh, turned into this very convenient um, bad guy, and uh, we should be looking at Putin as doing something we're trying to stop and we're trying to turn back and bring peace to the region. But, um, yeah, I I think uh, the people who have had the toughest time um, under Putin and before that the Soviets were a lot of times were the Russian people. Um, they, I, I think a lot of them can be naturally on our side about a whole bunch of issues. Gosh, if you've ever um, hung out with, especially like Russian immigrants here in the States, or um, people there, they are not their government, and they are not the ones making decisions about where troop movements go. And um, they can be our best friends in this, just reaching out to them, making sure that they know that any kind of sanctions are against Vladimir Putin, and certainly not against them. So, yeah, pu- punishing uh, young kids trying to learn and uh, make them feel bad because of their ethnicity, um, I thought that's everything we stood against. Or what about, I mean, is, is chess master Gary Kasparov, is he not welcoming the United States? He's been railing against Putin for two decades. I mean, he's but he's Russian. Yeah, exactly. And uh, there's been some people, too, suggesting any uh, anyone who's a Russian citizen in the NHL Kick them out of the league. Okay, guys, slow down. Slow down. Once again, this this could be uh, kind of a pathway for patriotic Americans to uh, maybe convince Putin and other Russian citizens as they watch a hockey game or something like that 
that, uh, hey, we aren't the bad guys here. Putin is the bad guy. And uh, why don't we join up and try to get these troops out of Ukraine? Well, so Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin was on with uh, Lester Holt last night and again said no to, you know, a no-fly zone because that would result in a war with Russia. But are these sanctions, excuse me, sanctions crippling the Russian economy yet? Um, Yeah, I I think it's uh, putting a big scare into the people and the oligarchs, Amy. Um, It's we're going to have, well, as Joe Biden uh, did not give any hope to the Ukrainian people when he said, oh, it'll take about a month to see if this will help at all. Um, I don't think it'll take a month. But uh, once again, uh, we need to somehow convince the um, Russian people and uh, business owners and so forth in Russia that, yeah, this is not, we're not trying to hurt you. We're trying to get Putin to pull troops out of Ukraine. And uh, maybe you guys could have a talk with it. Maybe you could convince them. Um, uh, you know, looking at Russian history, uh, transitions of leadership tend to be rather rapid and unpredictable. So um, we'll see what happens there. Um, but I think they definitely will hurt a lot. I, I think also, though, we need to look at any kind of uh, pushback as well, not only militarily, but a very unstable, massive government with nuclear weapons can be a very dangerous thing. So we just shouldn't get too cocky about let's punish the Russian people and uh, push them over the edge to something even worse than what we have now. Uh, I wanted to get your reaction to something that uh, historian Victor Davis Hanson had to say about the West's response uh, to this Russian invasion. I thought it was interesting and a bit counterintuitive that he sees some reason for optimism. Take a listen. It's, it's very strange, and it's a parad- we're watching a, a, a global paradigm shift because China's watching this and they're thinking to themselves, wait a minute, is there any chance that the Taiwanese would fight like the Ukrainians? Is there any chance that the Western world would have that confidence again to isolate, ostracize, alienate us from all the world financial, cultural, economic levers of power and do to us what they're doing to Russia right now? Is there any chance that Australia, Japan, South Korea, uh, the United States would pour javelins into and and they're not sure of that answer. So what Mr. Zelensky, and he's become the global hero against this his antithesis Putin who's in a bunker trying to assassinate him while he's out with hardly any resources defiantly challenging uh, Putin and the Thai, and the Chinese are saying, is there going to be somebody in Taiwan like that? And if that is true, and they survive, it's going to be a, very important in deterring China. And then there's, what do you think about uh, VDH's analysis? I am never going to disagree with VDH. That's just an unwise <laughs> decision for any pundit. Um, if they're worth their salt, it's a fantastic point, and I think the most encouraging thing um, that he's bringing up as well is finally a lot of European capitals waking up to the reality of the world. The, um, the world, uh, our future is not going to be guaranteed by solar panels, windmills, and unicorn farts. It's going to be guaranteed by having being clear-eyed about the challenges in the world, including the great military challenges. And to see Germany talking about, well, maybe we should bring some nuclear plants back online. Why are we getting so much oil and gas from Russia? Um, Seeing Macron step up and doing a lot of um, diplomacy as well, Boris Johnson has been very tough. Um, We might not have a whole bunch of confidence in Joe Biden, but I'm glad to see, since this is a European issue, I'm very glad to see European leaders finally say, wow, it actually is still a dangerous world, and we can't just rely on America to protect us, especially considering uh, who's in the Oval Office these days. He is John Gabriel, editor-in-chief at ricochet.com and contributor to Arizona Republic, azcentral.com as well. John, thanks as always. Appreciate it. Oh, thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. Thank you. And he joined us on our turnkey.pro answer line. Listen to Dan and Amy on your smartphone. Download the AM560 mobile app today at 560theanswer.com slash mobile. A while back, we at AmericanEagle.com were asked to build the e-commerce site of a major candy distributor. With the need for a website that could take into account everything from shipping times to local weather, because, you know, candy melts, the task was not like taking candy from a baby. Fortunately, we live for a good digital challenge and free bonbons. So we got to work on a slew of complex integrations, including a shipping algorithm that factored in variables like distance, speed, and location. 
The website even let the end customer personalize their candy for special events, like weddings or, you know, major website launches. <laughs> when all was said and done, our client enjoyed a significant increase in traffic.